27th, Napoleon very much concerned about the treatment which Las Casas suffered and the detention of his own papers. He observed that if there had been any plot in Las Casas' letter, the governor could have perceived it in 10 minutes' perusal that in a few moments he could also see that the campaigns of Italy, ETC, contained nothing treasonable and that it was contrary to all law to detain papers belonging to him, Napoleon. Perhaps, said he, he will come up here some day and say that he has received intimation that a plot to effect my escape is in agitation, what guarantee have I that when I have nearly finished my history, he will not come up and seize the whole of it? It is true that I can keep my manuscripts in my own room, and with a couple of brace of pistols, I can dispatch the first who enters. I must burn the whole of what I've written. It served as an amusement to me in this dismal abode, and might perhaps have been interesting to the world, but with that Sibiro Siciliano, Sicilian spy, there's no guarantee or security. He violates every law. It tramples underfoot decency, politeness, and the common forms of society. He came up here with a savage joy beaming from his eyes because he had an opportunity of insulting and tormenting us. While surrounding the house with his staff, he reminded me of the savages of the South Sea Islands dancing around the prisoners whom they were going to devour. Tell him, continued he, what I said about his conduct. For fear that I should forget, he repeated his expressions about the savages a second time and made me say it after him. Went to Hut's Gate to see Sir Hudson Lowe, who had sent a dragoon for me. On my arrival, His Excellency told me that the campaigns of Italy and the official documents would be sent to Longwood the following day and desired me to tell General Bonaparte that all his papers had been kept sacred and that all his personal ones should be returned. As to Las Casas' journal, he said he would have some conversation with Count Bertrand concerning it. I informed His Excellency that Napoleon had disclaimed all knowledge of the project with countless causes had formed and added my own conviction that until the moment that the letters had been arrested, he was wholly ignorant of his intentions. Sir Hudson said that he acquitted him of any knowledge of it, which he desired me to tell him and congratulated himself on much of his own discernment in the opinion he had formed of countless causes. His servant saw young Las Casas afterwards, who was very unwell. During the time that I was examining him professionally, Sir Thomas Reed remained in the room. On my going out, Sir Thomas said that Old Las Casas has been so impertinent to the governor that the latter had ordered that he should not be permitted to see any person unless in the presence of some of the governor's staff. On my return, explained to Napoleon the governor's message and informed him that I had seen part of his paper sealed up. When I said that the governor had acquitted him of any participation in the business, if, said he, I had known of it and had not put a stop to it, I would have been worse than a pasta de catena lunatic. I suppose that he thinks that there was some plot for my escape. I can safely say that I left Elba with 800 men and arrived at Paris through France without any other plot than that of knowing the sentiments of the French nation. He then sent for Sandini, who had copied Las Casas' journal, and asked him the nature of it. Denny replied that it was a journal of everything remarkable that had taken place since the embarkation on board of the Balrofen and contained diverse anecdotes of different persons of Sir George Cockburn. How is he treated, said Napoleon? Come sassier indifferently. Has he said that I called him a requin shark? Yes, sire. Sir George Bingham, very well spoken of. 
Also, Colonel Wilkes, is there anything to compromise any person? Naming three or four. No, sire. Anything about Admiral Malcolm? Yes, sire. Does it say that I observed? Behold the countenance of an Englishman? Yes, sire. He's very well treated. And about the governor? A great deal, sir, replied Santini, who cannot help smiling. They say that I said, set an um, ignoble. He is a vile man, and that his face was the most ignoble I had ever seen. Santini replied in the affirmative, but added that his expressions were very frequently moderated. Napoleon asked if the antidote of the coffee cup was in it. Santini replied he did not re recollect it. Does it say that I called him a severe Sicilian? Oui, sire. Yes, sire. Say so no. That's his name, said the emperor. <laughs> Napoleon conversed about his brother Joseph, whom he described as being a most excellent character. His virtues and talents are those of a private character, and for such nature intended him. He's too good to be a great man. He has no ambition. He is very like me in person, but handsomer. He is extremely well informed, but his learning is not that which is fitted for a king, nor is he capable of commanding an army. The 29th, having been unwell for some days with a liver complaint, a disease extremely prevalent and frequently fatal in the island, and finding the symptoms considerably aggravated by their frequent journeys, I was obliged to make to town and plantation house. I felt it necessary to apply to Dr. Emmeline of the 53rd Regiment to bleed me to a very large extent before the abstraction of blood was well over. Sir Hudson Lowe came into my apartment. I informed him that Napoleon had said, what guarantee can I have that he will not come up some day when I have nearly finished my history and seize it under some pretext, which he had desired might be communicated to him? Sir Hudson replied, the guarantee of its good conduct. Shortly afterwards, I saw Napoleon in his dressing room. He was much pleased at having received the campaigns of Italy and added that he would reclaim the other papers. This governor, said he, if he has any delicacy, would not have continued to read a work in which his conduct was depicted in its true light. He must have been little satisfied with the comparisons made between Cockburn and him, especially where it's mentioned that I said the Admiral was rough, but incapable of a mean action, but that his successor is capable of everything that was blank and blank. I am glad, however, that he has read it, because he will see the real opinion that we have of him. While he was speaking, my vision became indistinct. Everything appeared to swim before my eyes, and I fell upon the floor in a fainting fit. When I recovered my senses and opened my eyes, the first object which presented itself to my view, I shall never forget. It was the countenance of Napoleon bending over my face and regarding me with an expression of great concern and anxiety. With one hand, he was opening my shirt collar and with the other holding a bottle de vinegar de catrevelor, double distilled vinegar, to my nostrils. He had taken off my cravat and dashed the contents of a bottle of eau de colonia, cologne water, over my face. When I saw you fall, said he, I first thought that your foot had slipped, but seeing you remain without motion, I apprehended that it was a fit of apoplexy, observing, however, that your face was the color of death, your lips white, and without motion, and no evident respiration or bloated countenance, I concluded directly that it was a fit of syncope, or that your soul had departed. Morshaw now came into the room, whom he ordered to give me some orange flower water, which was a favorite remedy of his. When he saw me fall in his haste, he broke the bell riband. He told me that he had lifted me up, placed me in a chair, torn off my cravat, dashed some eau de cologne and water over my face, etc., and asked if he had done right. I informed him that he had done everything proper, and as a surgeon would have done under similar circumstances, except that instead of allowing me to remain in a recumbent posture, he had placed me in a chair. When I was leaving the room, I heard him tell Marchand in an under voice to follow me for fear that I should have another fit. The 1st December, Napoleon, after some inquiries touching my health and the effects of the mercury upon me, observed that he wished causes to go away. 
as three or four months stay in St. Helena would be of little utility, either to Las Casas or himself. The next, said he, to be removed under some pretext will be Montalon, as they see that he is a most useful and consoling friend of me, and that he always endeavors to anticipate my wants. I am less unfortunate than them. I see nobody. They are subject to daily insults and vexations. They cannot speak. They cannot write. They cannot stir out without submitting to degrading restrictions. I am sorry that two months ago they did not all go. I have sufficient force to resist alone against this tyranny. It is only prolonging their agony to keep them here a few months longer. After they have been taken away, you will be set off. Alor, la cream, sera consommé. And then the crime will be consummated. They are subject to every caprice which arbitrary power chooses to inflict and are not protected. By any laws, he is at once a jailer, governor, accuser, judge, and sometimes executioner. For example, when he sees that East Indian servant who was recommended by that bravo, brave man, Colonel Skeleton, to General Montalon as a good servant, he came up here and seized the man with his own hands under my windows. He did justice to himself, certainly. Le métier d'un sbire lui convient beaucoup mieux que celui de représentant d'une grande nation. The deputy of a spy agrees much better with him than that of representing a great nation. A soldier is better off than they are as if he is accused. He must be tried according to known forms before he can be punished in the worst dungeon in England. A prisoner is not denied printed papers and books except obliging me to see him. He has done everything to annoy me. Instead of allowing us to be subject to the caprice of an individual, added he, there ought to be a council composed of the Admiral Sir George Bingham and two members of the council to debate and decide upon the measures necessary to be adopted towards us. The third, Napoleon sent for me at one o'clock. Yeah. found him in bed suffering from a headache and a general uneasiness, which had been preceded by shiverings. Had a little fever during the night. I recommended some remedies and pointed out in strong terms the necessity there was of his following my advice, and especially in taking exercise, and my firm conviction that in the contrary case he would soon be seized with an alarming fit of illness. Tant de merlio, replied Napoleon, plus presto si finira, so much the better, it will be soon finished. The fourth wrote an account of the state of Napoleon's health and of the advice which I had given him to Sir Hudson Well. Napoleon, somewhat better, observed that it was impossible for him to follow the recommendation I had given him to take exercise first on account of the restrictions and next the furious wind, or when that was calm, the want of shade at Longwood to protect him from the rays of the tropical sun. He gave his opinion about Moreau and others. Moreau said he was an excellent general division, but not fit to command a large army. With 100,000 men, Moreau would divide his army in different positions covering roads and would not do more than if he had only 30,000. He did not know how to profit either by the number of his troops or by their positions. Very calm and cool in the field, he was more collected and better able to command in the heat of an action than to make dispositions prior to it. He was often seen smoking his pipe in battle. Moreau was not naturally a man of a bad heart. Un bon vivant, mais il n'avait pas beaucoup de caractère. What who lived well but had no character, he was led by his wife. Another intriguing Creole, his having toward Pichigru and George in the conspiracy and subsequently having closed his life fighting against his country will ever disgrace his memory as a general Moreau was infinitely inferior to De Say or to Clibert, even to Sewell. Of all the generals I've ever had under me, Desai and Claver possessed the greatest talents, especially Desai, as Claver only loved glory inasmuch as it was the needs of procuring him riches and pleasures, whereas Desai loved glory for itself and despised everything else. Desai was wholly wrapped up in war and glory. To him, riches and pleasure were valueless, nor did he give them a moment's thought. He was 
a little black looking man about an inch shorter than I am, always badly dressed, sometimes even ragged and despising comfort or convenience. When in Egypt, I made him a present of a complete field equipage several times, but he always lost it. Wrapped up in a cloak to say through himself under a gun and slept as contentedly as if he were in a palace. For him, luxury had no charm. Upright and honest in all his proceedings, he was called by the Arabs the just sultan. He was intended by nature for a great general. Clavert and Desay were a loss, a reputable to France. Had Clavert lived, your army in Egypt would have perished. Had that imbecile Manu attacked you on your landing with 20,000 men, as he might have done instead of the division land news, your army would have been only a meal for them. Your army was 17 or 18,000 strong without cavalry.